In the war's bitter aftermath, the Israeli people would demand Golda Meir's resignation. Moshe Dayan, too, would leave office. They were used to win easily everything, to get easily everything. So they got used to that. And once we came against a very difficult war, an extremely difficult war, we had to face 5,000 uh, uh, tanks both on both fronts, on the, the Egyptian and Syrian, which is more tanks than the German used when they fought the Maginot Line. More than that. And we are three million people. And we did, uh, we, were, we were taken by surprise. And our army was not mobilized. And still we managed. And we got, we crossed the canal and we got close to Cairo. And uh, since then, I think that was the turning point with the spirit of uh, the Israelis. Stung by criticism of his part of the war, Moshe Dayan, at 58, would focus his energies on a formidable new mission. Dayan had long sought a way for Israel to find a lasting peace with the Arabs. For though he had proven a relentless enemy of the Arabs in battle, he understood and appreciated their culture. Unlike most Israelis, Dayan spoke Arabic. Since childhood, he had felt at ease among the Bedouin nomads of the desert. Personally, I liked them. I liked them. But even if I disliked them, I would have uh, been involved in politics and uh, realizing that we have to live with them, I would have said, uh, for the better or for the worse, we have to find a way how to live together. As comfortable among Bedouin chiefs as he would be on an Israeli kibbutz, Diane would help guide Israel on the dangerous road to peace. Moshe Dayan's bond with the Muslim nomads of the desert came from a shared heritage based on the Old Testament and from a shared past stretching back over 3,000 years. While a soldier conducting his Sinai campaigns, Diane would become fascinated with the history concealed beneath the sand. A passionate amateur archaeologist, he would make numerous discoveries. Diane would explore the desert in his every spare moment, driven by a mystical bond with Israel's ancient heritage. A gifted author and poet, he would write several books inspired by a burning desire to unearth the living past. So I got fond of collecting antiquities, going to ancient places, and sometimes I felt that there is no separation between the past and the present, as if I was associated with some of the personalities that were mentioned in the Bible. Although digging for artifacts violated Israeli law, Diane insisted he was preserving precious relics that would otherwise be destroyed. He amassed an impressive collection, valued at over $2 million, which would eventually be acquired by an Israeli museum. But until then, his discoveries would be preserved at his home near Tel Aviv. Archaeology is something that you can touch with your hands. The, the uh, cooking pot, it's still got the black mark on it. And when you discover it, I have the feeling that here, that was really a cooking pot where the family had their soup or meat. So what could be really more interesting than to go into different worlds up to 6,000, 9,000 years back, period after period, and that can be done in this country. Tragically, a place deemed holy by Christian, Muslim, and Jew was also steeped in religious hatred and bloodshed. 
In 1977, Moshe Dayan would face his most difficult challenge to help fulfill the elusive dream of peace. In an ironic twist of fate, Dayan would be named foreign minister by his old enemy, now Prime Minister Menachem Begin. President Jimmy Carter invited both Begin and Egyptian President Anwar Sadat to come to Camp David for historic peace talks. Meeting with Sadat, Dayan was a skilled negotiator who was protective of Israel's interests, but understood the Arabs' point of view. He proved a vital catalyst to helping both sides reach an agreement. At last, a historic breakthrough. The Camp David Accords, making possible the first peace treaty between Israel and an Arab nation. For Moshe Dayan, this peace accord was the fulfillment of his career. Throughout his life, when Moshe Dayan spoke, his nation listened. In his later years, despite an operation for cancer, Moshe Dayan never ceased to speak his mind. And whether Israelis agreed with him or not, they were drawn to the old Dayan magic. For he was not only a legendary military hero, but an eloquent and impassioned orator. A strong advocate for Israel's security, Dayan would often visit outposts on the nation's borders. Memories of his victories on the battlefield might fade with time, but Dayan's stamp on the Israeli military would endure. His legacy would live on in the proud spirit of Israel's armed forces. Dayan was mindful that despite the historic breakthrough at Camp David, their world was still a dangerous place. It was not yet time to beat their swords into plowshares. The peace process would be slow and arduous. Until Israel could negotiate a lasting peace with all of its Arab neighbors, he believed the only hope for her survival lay in vigilance and a military powerful enough to stop aggression. Moshe Dayan had fought many battles, traveled the world. But in 1979, as his health was failing, he would take a final journey home. It was a voyage across time as well as space, a pilgrimage across Israel to the land of his childhood. Like other warriors before him, David, Joshua, Saul, Moshe Dayan's name would be written in the turbulent history of this land. In his lifetime, he had seen a handful of hardy pioneers swell into a proud modern nation. Perhaps without his military genius, it could not have survived. If Moshe Dayan's dream would be fulfilled, future generations in this land would see less bloodshed than his generation had been forced to endure. At last, he reached the settlement of Nahalal in the Valley of Jezreel. His life had traveled full circle back to the place of its beginning. Here I am going to be buried, overlooking my village, Nahalal, and being with all these people who are buried here people who really devoted all their life with a very hard work for the country, being farmers, and I'm going to be with them. I don't want any speeches at my funeral. I don't want any decoration, any place to be called after me. To be with these people, this is the highest decoration. I lived my life, and then I die, and I'll be buried here, here, in this cemetery, in my village cemetery, overlooking the Valley of Israel. What a wonderful place. 
On October 18, 1981, Moshe Dayan was buried in the place he loved. As he wished, no eulogies were spoken at his funeral. But a nation mourned him, for his legacy lay not in the past, but in a future of hope for the land he helped create. A man of war with the wisdom to make peace. <laughs>